This is CBC Here and Now. John Steele says anyone coming in here will be 19 and over. He said everyone has a responsibility to do their part. Planning for the next big music festival. Organizers say masks are a must. We're watching the remnants of what was Hurricane Ida bring lots of rainfall to the Maritime Provinces. That's what's headed our way as we head through the night tonight. Rain and wind warnings are in place. I was very fortunate to just be a very kind of curious kid with really supportive parents, uh, where at the age of six, I told them, hey, I want to be, well, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon at that age, but I told them I want to be a doctor, and they just said, okay. Well, she didn't become a brain surgeon, but this doctor is the first in a cardiac surgeon in the country. And she's right here working in St. John's. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Jeremy Eaton. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. A second summer music festival in St. John's is taking some preemptive steps. Yes, with daily COVID case numbers creeping up, the organizer wants to ward off any criticism. The Iceberg Alley performance tent runs from September 8th to the 18th. And as Terry Roberts reports, festival goers will have no option. Face masks will be mandatory. I'm here on the shores of Kitty Vitty and behind me the massive Iceberg Alley performance tent where up to 2,700 people will gather each night beginning next Wednesday. And if you're one of them, you won't want to forget to bring one of these. When you're in here and the music is blasting, your face and nose will have to be covered unless, and here's the wording, unless you're actively eating or drinking. These heightened measures are in response to the criticism levied against those attending the George Street Festival. Troubling videos like this, very few face masks, barely a semblance of social distancing. So Iceberg Alley organizer John Steele wants to avoid any hint of criticism and ensure the safest possible event in this era of COVID-19. He's welcoming a recommendation by public health that masks be worn when physical distancing is a challenge. When you look at a, a year ago, we couldn't have any type of event going on. When you look at what we're able to do today is to do an event where we ask you to wear a mask and uh, to wash your hands and, and practice the uh, best practices that you're able to do in that environment. We think we've come a long way in a year and we don't think that's too much to ask. With more than 70% of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians fully vaccinated, no reports of COVID-19 community spread, and participants expected to take the appropriate precautions inside a tent that is well ventilated, Steele believes the situation is manageable. Organizers say security will be keeping a watchful eye to ensure these public health measures are respected. But John Steele says that since everyone coming here will be 19 and over, it'll be their responsibility as well to make sure these rules are respected. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. And a reminder from the province, September 30th is the deadline to apply for some COVID-19 assistance programs. The Artist Support Program is a one-time payment of up to $5,000. That aims to give relief to professional artists and musicians who've lost opportunities and earnings as a result of the pandemic. Now, there's also the Hospitality Support Program that offers a payment of $2,500 or 5% of a business's total loss of sales up to 50 thousand dollars. And we have a public health advisory to share with you now following yesterday's announcement of eight new COVID-19 cases in the province. Now, five of those cases were in the Eastern Health Region, and now public health is advising people who visited Sobeys on Rope Walk Lane in St. John's on Sunday, August 29th, between 3 and 6 p.m. to call 811 to arrange for testing. Now, if you're experiencing symptoms, you're asked to isolate until 24 hours after those symptoms resolve and you receive a negative test. We started to see the rain move in uh, earlier this afternoon for parts of the province, and that is out ahead of what was Hurricane Ida. The remnants have rolled through uh, most of the province, or most of the maritime provinces, rather. Some areas see in excess of 150 millimeters of rain. Now, I don't see that much rain falling uh, for here in Newfoundland and Labrador. The rainfall warnings will ex or are extending, though, from uh, pretty much the northern peninsula down through to uh, Port of Basque, including Burgio. Uh, 
the uh, Humber Valley as well as Green Bay, White Bay. And then we've got those wind warnings in place as well from Parsons Pond through to Port Baskin. We're going to see those winds ramp up tonight. Uh, the strongest winds in those easterly where you're prone to easterlies. You could see uh, gusts in excess of about 100 kilometers per hour. And those winds will continue as we get into the early morning hours. Eventually, we'll see them ease through the day, but I'll get into all the rest of the details when I come back. To the southern shore now, where there's more opposition to a planned seal processing plant in Tours Cove. Some residents want the province to take a second look, saying that the project has been shrouded in secrecy. The broadcast, Todd O'Brien, spoke with some people in the community about their concerns. Now, this was a, a, a working fish plant for decades. Uh, people were happy to see it here. There was lots of jobs. And uh, so what are your concerns? The fish plant has been closed for a while, right? There's been new people move in here, for one thing. Plus, uh, a lot has changed. Like, where's the workforce coming from? Every other processing plant around here is importing workers. So if the only pro in this thing is employment, is it really a pro when you have to import the workers? Because all we're seeing is cons, but we don't know the whole process. But I worked at a seal plant before, and the smell is unbearable. You don't want to live close. We haven't had uh, any public consultation, and there hasn't really been uh, any information that's shared to us. Uh, it seems like this has been really shrouded in secrecy. Uh, so we want to get information. We have a lot of concerns. Uh, and reaching out to anything, uh, any authority in power, uh, whether it be ministers or the company itself, uh, hasn't yielded any information uh, that's tangible for us. The community has changed. There's new things coming in and there's new sectors of uh, commercial growth that have uh, brought economic uh, opportunities here. There's lots of businesses here. I have lots of new friends who've moved in um, because of the tourism opportunities that this place affords, because of the quiet, because of the lifestyle. And those things have really not been taken into consideration. Um, we have gotten absolutely no response around, um, you know, the conservation, the chemicals that will be used, the smell, and there's been no socioeconomic assessment to really sh show us that this is actually going to be beneficial to the community. If we could only get a meeting with the people that's purchasing the plant, we'd be in business. Maybe we could sit down and settle something. And uh, this is a real tourist place, not for sales. They should, they got to truck in the sales from across the island. So, uh, you know, uh, these seals could be on the go for two and three weeks, so you know what the strength is from those. And uh, the East Coast Trail, look, just comes right across on the back of up here at the fish plant. And we get so many tourists over the years, it's unreal. If this comes, I'd ask Minister Davis to have a second look at it. Because I tell you, if it was in the, Mr. Davis's uh, community, he'd certainly have a second look. And we're asking you, Mr. Minister, please, on behalf of the residents of Torsco, we'd like for you to take a second look. A 26-year-old is in custody after intentionally ramming an RCMP cruiser in Carmenville last night. The cruiser was parked at an off-duty officer's residence when the incident happened. RCMP officers were dispatched from Gander, Twillingate and Glovertown. They located the suspect's vehicle, which had been abandoned on Route 331 near Wings Point. He was later found at a nearby business and taken into custody. Well, it was pretty quiet on the campaign trail today. The leaders are gathering in Montreal for tonight's French language debate. Green Party leader Annemie Paul was not invited. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh is the only leader who had organized an event today. Some of this poutine will fill you, not just your stomach, but fill you up with some optimism. Definitely give me some feedback because this is my own personal recipe, uh, Punjabi poutine. Singh was providing lunch for some Montrealers and campaigning with some local candidates. He spent most of his question and answer session with reporters attacking the record of the Liberal government. Liberal leader Justin Trudeau is in Montreal as well. He did some whistle-stop campaigning with local candidates. Canada's Elections Commissioner has cleared Ontario Liberal candidate Chrystia Freeland over some recent campaign tweets. Now, you may remember that those tweets targeted Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole and had been labeled as manipulated media by Twitter. Freeland posted the tweets about two weeks ago. They contained edited clips of the Conservative leader answering yes 
when he was asked if he would bring for-profit health care to Canada. O'Toole had also said that universal access remains paramount. The Elections Commissioner ruled no offense had been committed under the Elections Act. It's been one long journey for a Natwashish man who walked 600 kilometers in 24 days. It's all in support of his brother's kidney transplant. Yes, Tommy Poker says after his brother had kidney failure, he had to do something. The CBC's Heidi Adder has more. It's been a grueling 24 days of sun, rain, gravel roads, and honking cars for Tommy Poker. He started his walk in Lanza Claire at the southern end of Labrador. His parents, girlfriend, and child have been following him closely, showing their support, their trucks proudly displaying where Tommy's already traveled, a journey he's taken on for his brother Simeon. I'm very proud. I'm very proud of my brother so much. Simeon needs a new kidney. That's the inspiration behind this month-long walk. And in the rain on Wednesday, Tommy reached his finish line, Happy Valley Goose Bay, welcomed by family, friends, and supporters. Just cut a hole in and just, I just cried. I'm glad I finished. I didn't expect this many people, really. <laughs> it was overwhelming. I was just glad I finished, really. <laughs> I couldn't have taken nice long rest now. <laughs> Through his walk, Tommy has raised more than the $30,000 goal for Simeon's travel and other related expenses. A generous gift from one brother, but in his family that's not rare. Their other brother, Timmy, is the one donating his kidney. It really means a lot uh, because I, I don't see anybody else doing this kind of thing like in other families, but this one is special I think. The surgery is scheduled to happen in the next few months. Heidi Adder, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay, Labrador. Certainly felt a little bit humid out there today across uh, eastern portions of the island. Most of us really did see that. I'll explain what that is and I'll have your full forecast coming up.
My name is Finn Hewlin. We live in Canada. And, and I'm so excited to go to school because I know meet a lot of friends and see a lot of friends and go on the school bus and get the, go at the bus stop. And, and I'm going to bring my Batman book bag. <laughs> I'm excited to go to kindergarten because I want to play at the dollhouse. I like to lose. My name is Beckham Bowers. I live in Hollywood. I'm excited about uh, I'm going on the gold bus my first time. Hi, my name is Darcy Kelly and I am going to go to St. Andrew's School and I am going to go on the bus and I am so excited. Too adorable. I absolutely love these. These are they are absolutely adorable. Yeah, and if one of those soon to be kindergartens gardeners look familiar, we apologize, but we had to re-air Beckham Bartlett's message. Yes, we had his name wrong a, a little earlier in the week, so so sorry about that, Beckham. So uh, we failed our spelling <laughs> test on that one, but it gave us an excuse to play your so sweet back to school message one more time. So uh, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> It's great. Yeah. Now onto the weather. Uh, another humid one here uh, in the St. John's area and on the Avalon. Yeah, so I thought it might be a good time for a little science lesson. Summer. Sunny, hot, humid weather. It doesn't happen very often in Newfoundland and Labrador, but it sure did this year. We typically see 9 to 12 humid days a year on the island and a couple in the big land. And don't get me wrong, we've had our fair share of those sticky days over the years. And during the summer of 2018, it actually snowed on June 26th before becoming the most humid summer on record. This summer has been a humid one too. So far, we've doubled the average in St. John's, logging 18 days of 30 plus humidex. The reason for all of this humidity, a Bermuda high. It's exactly what it sounds like, a ridge of high pressure that sits over Bermuda in the summer and funnels hot, humid air our way. And remember that persistent heat in Western Canada? The jet stream brought that our way too. So what is humidity? It's the amount of water vapor in the air. So when it's humid, there's lots of moisture in the air, so much that our sweat can't evaporate. So it actually feels sticky. The best way to measure that sticky feeling is using something called the dew point. That's the temperature water vapor condenses to liquid. The higher the dew point, the more moisture in the air and the more tropical the conditions. And with climate change at the forefront, we can expect to see more of this in the coming years. I love a good science lesson. That was really interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we talked a lot about dew point this yeah. year. We talked a lot about humidity, so I figured it was a good time to teach a Yeah, and bit. it's nice to know how many days of humidity we had, because I know a lot of people have been talking that it seemed like we're getting a lot of humid days, so yep. now we know for sure. And we certainly did, mm -hmm. double that, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the humidity is back a little yep. bit today uh, in St. John's. How long is that going to be sticking around? Yeah, so a lot of that has to do with the remnants of Ida. Mm -hmm. That is bringing all of that tropical moisture up. Uh, so we're going to see it for another day, I guess, and then that will be the end of it for a little while. Let's take a look at what we saw today. Uh, as far as temperatures and humidex goes, this is where we're currently sitting right now. 16 degrees in St. John's, but it feels more like 21 uh, with that humidex. And those numbers uh, are starting to uh, creep up as well for St. Lawrence, feeling more like 22. And then uh, some pretty humid conditions or some humid conditions on the west coast as well. Uh, up across Labrador, not a whole lot to speak of. In fact, none. Your temperatures are into the double digits, just barely. Lab City at 10 degrees and uh, same thing for Nain cooler temperatures uh, towards the coast. So what do we have going on right now? Well, we've got an area of low pressure. That's the remnants of Tropical Storm Ida. Lots of rain for the maritime provinces today. And that rain started to work its way towards the island uh, earlier this afternoon. Now that radar is still down on uh, the west coast and will be until next summer. But we are seeing those showers to the south and most areas are seeing those showers right now. 
and that is generally going to continue. So we do have rainfall warnings from the northern peninsula through down to Burgio uh, and then special weather statements extending through the interior as well as uh, Conagra Peninsula and then Bay of Exploits and then that uh, wreck house wind warning in effect. So those winds are going to ramp up as we head through the evening hours tonight. Now the one thing to watch is that moisture. I talked about the amount of moisture in the atmosphere. This is called precipitable water. So it's how much moisture is available to fall in the atmosphere. We saw lots of it across the maritime provinces, but look at what happens as we head through the evening hours and into the early morning hours. Looks like we're going to see most of that uh, precipitation or at least the precipitable uh, water head towards central Newfoundland. So that's where we're expecting to see the majority of the rainfall. So that's good news. We may not see as uh, heavy amounts as we first anticipated, but as we head through Friday and into Saturday, that moisture heads towards the Avalon. So we could see, that's when I'm anticipating, we will see the heaviest rain likely Friday night and through Saturday for eastern areas of the island. By the time Saturday evening rolls around, we're going to say goodbye to that for a little while. So here's a look at the winds tonight, just to time things out and the rain. Uh, we're looking at that moving in overnight. The winds ramping up uh, in the early morning hours for the, the southern portion and then those areas that are prone to easterlies. You could see gusts upwards of about 100 kilometers per hour and then we'll eventually see those winds head further north as the, the morning rolls through. So you're looking at 70 to 80 kilometer per hour wind gusts uh, in those exposed areas. And then uh, as far as the winds in eastern areas, we'll see that pick up uh, through the day tomorrow. So overnight tonight, temperatures not dipping too, too much. You're sitting between 10 to 16 degrees. Uh, cooler though, up across Labrador, even the risk of frost uh, for Lab West tonight. Three degrees will be your overnight low. And then as we uh, head through the night, this is the amount of rainfall. Now I have this going through to Saturday uh, night, but it does look like the majority of the rain will fall along the west coast and it will more than likely be in the higher elevations where we see uh, the heaviest rain. Good 30 to 60 millimeters is possible and anywhere in that orange essentially and then the higher elevations could see in excess of that about 60 to 80 millimeters is certainly possible. So uh, as far as tomorrow goes and uh, we see that rain, you will see the heavier rain though taper off as the day goes on. It'll taper to showers and then we'll see some of that shower activity head towards eastern areas of the island. Winds will be gusting anywhere from about 40 to 60 kilometers per hour. And like I said, Friday night into Saturday, we see that bigger push of moisture, which is when we should see the heaviest rainfall amounts and we could see another 10 to as much is 20 millimeters with that. So uh, also the risk tomorrow of some thunderstorms likely going to see the risk in the early morning hours for the southern areas, but then the rest of eastern Newfoundland will see that risk through the afternoon. Temperatures tomorrow sitting in the 20s. Uh, again, those winds picking up as the day goes on towards central. Again, another humid day possible or likely as well. Uh, about 22 degrees for Gander. A little bit cooler uh, towards the southern areas of the island. Again, those winds, the strongest in the east, they'll taper off right away uh, into the afternoon, about 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. And to stay into those single digits for most of Labrador, 9 degrees for Cartwright. The rest of Labrador looking at a beautiful day, uh, 12 degrees and a mix of sun and cloud for Lab City and sunshine for Nain tomorrow. So that's a look at your forecast for tomorrow. We'll look ahead for the rest of the long weekend when I come back. Katarina Roxon has another Paralympic has another Paralympic Games under her belt, and now she's done. The United States took home the gold in the 4x100 meter medley relay earlier today. But CBC Sports caught up with Katarina and her teammates poolside after her final swim. Kat, this was your last race here in Tokyo. Yep. Is there was there a moment in the, in the race or in the ready room or even now that you you you're telling yourself? Maybe this was my last race at the Paralympics. Ah, yeah, you know what, I've been saying that a few few times throughout the meet, but you know what, I, right now I'm just enjoying the moment, enjoying the experience of it. Um, obviously I'm going to take a break afterwards, but you know, you never know what's going to happen, you never know what it's, what's going to change, so right now enjoying the last few days we have here in Tokyo and then figure out what I'm going to do next. Well, Canada picked up two silver medals on day nine of the Tokyo 2020 Paralympics, making it 18 in total at these games. Here's Devin Haru with more on the day's competition. Day nine at the Paralympics was always going to be about two of Canada's brightest stars. 
Brent Lakatos and Orly Rivard back in competition a day after winning more medals for Canada. So let's go to the Tokyo Aquatic Center first. 25 year old Rivard out of Quebec swimming in the 100 meter backstroke event. And guess what? She didn't disappoint. Swimming to silver, it's her fifth medal of these games. She has two golds, one silver, two bronze. Incredible stuff. She has 10 medals in her Paralympic career. Now to National Stadium where Brent Lakatos, 41 years old, looking for a gold medal at these games. He already has three silvers. In an interview yesterday, he says, I just want gold. He has to settle for another silver. In driving rain, less than ideal conditions at National Stadium here in Tokyo tonight. Lakatos trying to push for gold, falling just short, finishing second. His fourth silver medal of these games and incredibly his 11th career medal at the Paralympics. Much more ahead, three days left of competition in these games. Mark this one on your calendar. Canada's sitting volleyball team going up against China in the semifinals, 7.30 a.m. Eastern time back home Friday morning in Canada. It's the first time this program has made it this far at the Paralympic Games. So get ready for the finish. Extensive coverage continues. Devin Haru for CBC Sports in Tokyo. Coming up on Here and Now, we're going to meet Canada's first in a cardiac surgeon. And so if my story can be, you know, inspiration or motivation or something that just one person can connect with, then that's meaningful to me. I'll have that story coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Our next guest has a pretty impressive resume. In 2018, she won an Inspire Award for Inuit Youth. In 2019, Queen's University Alumni Association called her one to watch. She has multiple degrees. She's a doctor. On top of that, she's a surgeon. On top of that, she's Canada's first Inuk cardiac surgeon. Now joining us is Dr. Kim Larjuk. Dr. K, how you doing? Good, thanks. How are you? So, with a resume, which is a lot more impressive than what I just listed, you could have gone anywhere to be a cardiac <laughs> surgeon. Why did you pick Eastern Health and why St. John's? A little backstory, I just spent the last year in the States, um, and the plan was always to come back to Canada, because uh, I'm Canadian, I love being home, and so I started looking for jobs, and there was a job posted in St. John's, I interviewed, and to be honest, I had just such a good feeling about the group. Um, the cardiologists, the anesthesiologists, the surgeons, it just felt right. I'm a person that really likes to listen to her gut. Um, and I felt, okay, This, I think this is gonna be the right fit. I trained in Ottawa before that, and I know they have a really strong relationship with Ottawa. Uh, in fact, right now, there's some surgeons that are flying out to come do some cases here. Uh, so I still have that connection to folks that I really know and who trained me. So I just felt it'd be a really good fit. And uh, also it helps my fiance is from Ireland, so I knew he'd love it here, which he does, so. <laughs> now, as I said, you're Canada's first Inuk cardiac surgeon. Tell us a little bit about your backstory, where you come from. Yeah, so um, I was born in Winnipeg, uh, raised very briefly up in the north where my mother's family is from in Nunavut, uh, but really I was raised in Ottawa. Ottawa's my home, um, that's where my parents are, um, and you know, we lived up north very briefly, but my parents felt I had better educational opportunities being in the south in a big city, so we settled in Ottawa where there's a large Inuit population, so we, we could be connected to our culture. Um, and I was very fortunate to just be a very kind of curious kid with really supportive parents, uh, where at the age of six, I told them, hey, I wanna be, well, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon at that age, but I told them I wanna be a doctor. And they just said, okay, you're gonna have to work hard, but all right, go for it. I've never been the first in anything. I've been the last in a lot of things, but never the first. What's it like, or what does it mean to you to be the first endocardiac surgeon in Canada? To be honest, it's not something that I really think of in my day-to-day -day life. Um, when I set out to become a heart surgeon, it was just very much my selfish want to be a heart surgeon for me. Like, this is what I loved doing. I thought I'd be good at it. This is what I wanted to do. Um, but then this title kind of came associated with it. And so I'm really honored. I'm really humbled, really flattered. And I'm happy to actually have this platform or this opportunity to share my story because I recognize the importance of young people having role models in their life. And so I had very strong role models. I know a lot of people don't. And so if my story can be, you know, inspiration or motivation or something that just one person can connect with, then that's meaningful to me. So with you being the first, is that is there added pressure as well that comes along with that? Um, you know, it's a good question. I don't recognize if it does, maybe it does. I, I guess just... as a surgeon, there's, you're used to pressure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think when I first started getting some of the attention, I was still a resident doctor, so I was still in training. I didn't have my full license yet. I hadn't passed my board exams. I was like, I'm a nobody. So I definitely felt the pressure because it's like, if you fail, people will know. Um, but now I don't, I don't feel like it does. I'm, you know, I'm used to the pressure, like you said, and I'm just happy to do something meaningful and hopefully it's positive for others. Besides being in the OR, other interests in medicine are really looking at Indigenous and women's heart health. So um, there's the Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance Network, this national organization that looks at improving women's heart health outcomes that I've been fortunate to be a part of. Um, there's a lot of committees that are being formed with the Canadian Medical Association, with the College of Physicians and Surgeons, uh, looking at how do we improve Indigenous health, how do we incorporate Indigenous health curriculum into our residency programs. Uh, so I've had a lot of great opportunities presented to me um, because of attention like this. So uh, hopefully, again, it's meaningful work that I can contribute to. You know, when I'm in the OR, am I practicing my culture in the traditional sense? No, you know, and it's not always the forefront of my mind, but just that connection to my family, to my ancestors, to our values and traditions is very strong. And so I feel, again, very fortunate that I was raised with our culture very much part of our day-to-day -day life. Um, so very much important place in my heart. Um, 
end. I mean, I'm excited to hopefully get up to Labrador at some point, um, maybe do some clinics up there, outreach work, get to eat some country food, which would be great. So uh, definitely the food and culture is important to me. With the Kabul airport not currently in operation, border crossings in Afghanistan are even more crucial for Afghans trying to flee the Taliban, as well as for commercial traffic. The CBC's Susan Ormiston is in the neighboring Pakistan and has this report from the key border town of Torkham. This convoy of trucks has just left Afghanistan, bringing fresh produce into Pakistan. We think seeing things like tomatoes and onions and cotton goods all coming from the border crossing just about a kilometer down this valley, a very important economic link for both countries. And it is open now, but there's long lineups, sometimes days of lineups of these trucks trying to go back and forth. How does he feel about about the Taliban taking a new government? Everything fine there. The government is good because we used to pay money, but now we can free. We were down there for a couple of hours today, 
and we saw just a trickle of Afghans coming into Pakistan. The country has said with one and a half million refugees here already, they can't handle tens of thousands more. So they're only letting in those for medical emergencies or who, who have business on either side of the border. The UN is warning of a humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. And this kind of commerce going in is a critical link, especially with the airport closed. So these trucks are going into Afghanistan. We saw young boys down at that border hiding in the wheel wells of trucks coming from Afghanistan. Once into Pakistan, they jump off with bags of what looked like produce over their shoulders to go sell in the market. The UN is warning that up to half a million Afghans may try to flee their country by the end of this year. They'll be trying to get to land borders like this, but in many places, they're blocked from moving on. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, at the Torkham border crossing in Pakistan. Well, classes are underway at McGill University for this year's fall semester, but there are some instructors and students who are unhappy with the school's COVID-19 plan. As Kubina Oduro reports, they're asking for a mandatory vaccination requirement and options for remote learning. Madison Edward Wright is on campus for her first in-person classes. Last year, all her classes were online. Now, she's ready to meet her classmates face-to-face. -to, -face. to a certain degree, I feel safe because we're wearing masks, but because there's absolutely no distancing, it does feel quite weird. I don't know if I'm quite ready for that. For some, that's not enough. They want more safety measures from the university for the return to campus life. I feel very let down by my university because there's, I love, there's people in my life who I love who are immunocompromised and disabled and they deserve to have a university that values their life and McGill is just clearly not doing that. McGill is returning to mostly in-person courses for the fall with some exceptions for large classes. Masks are mandatory for students in classrooms and labs at all times but in most classrooms no distancing is required. Neither is a proof of vaccination. Uh, so McGill has internationally renowned experts in public health and epidemiology and law. And all of these experts are saying that we're not doing enough. We should have a vaccine mandate. We should have routine testing on campus. Um, none of these things are being done. In a memo obtained by CBC, staff were told, fear about campus safety or concern about relatives who might be at heightened risk are not valid reasons for granting permission to teach remotely. While Hendrick says his biggest classes have up to 100 students, the biggest classrooms hold up to 600. You know, if, if you know, 10 or 15 percent of them aren't vaccinated, that's a lot of people. And we know that this variant can spread uh, very easily and very rapidly through groups like that. In a statement, McGill University says the safety of their staff and students, it's its utmost priority. At this time, it says its view, it's, it cannot legally require vaccinations. Both Hendricks and Downey say it's not too late for the university to implement more measures now. Kubino Duro, CBC News, Montreal. We want to bring you a behind-the-scenes look now at a little-known part of Halifax history. The CBC's Brett Ruskin was granted special access to a centuries-old communication system hiding in plain sight. And even some locals don't know how it works. Usually, this is what happens to ice cream in the sun. But here, the hot sun keeps things cool. So on the top of the trailer, we have four solar panels, and they connect to these wires here that lead down to the generator box and then the generator connects the wires. Um, I'm being considered as being a plant snob and I'm not uh, not proud of that. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it as it is. When you're the man behind the Mun Botanical Gardens, I think you can call yourself a plant snob. But what does Todd Boland's garden look like? That's coming up.
Uh, let's try this again. The CBC's Brett Ruskin was granted special access to a centuries-old communication system hiding in plain sight in Halifax. And even some of the locals don't know how it works. Some of Halifax's traditions are hard to miss. Hey! Like the noon gun, disrupting downtown lunch breaks for decades. But others go right over people's heads. At one time, everyone here knew what this flag mast was for. But now? No idea. That one? Yeah. No. I honestly don't. I'm not sure. <laughs> A modern mystery to most locals. Each day, though, teams work to get the flags up. Hoist away. I was shown the ropes, but still didn't quite get it. Turns out this mast was critical because it showed which vessels were coming into port. You can imagine people walking around looking at their cell phones. Uh, you can imagine Victorian Hel Heligonians walking around looking at the signal post. This flag was for James Creighton's family business. According to this 1800s ad, they sold produce from West India and the Mediterranean. So when each specific flag went up... When you saw that signal, you knew you had about two hours or so before the vessel arrived at the dock and you could prepare your warehouse. Keep in mind, this is before the car, the telephone, even Morse code. Or you could send a signal over a great distance because... You've got one here, you've got one at York Redoubt. Indeed, there was another mast six kilometers away across the harbor at York Redoubt, another historic hilltop fort. But could you really see the flags from here? Using my camera like a 19th century telescope, I watched the flags unfurl. And there were two more stations farther out to sea. This relay could send ship information in a matter of minutes. The plan was to have a system that went all the way from Halifax to Quebec. That system turned out to be expensive to staff, and the plan was scrapped. But to honor its innovation, and perhaps confuse locals, this 1800s instant messaging is still replicated today. Brett Ruskin, CBC News, Halifax. Well, now it's time for a visit to another amazing garden in St. John's. So Todd Bowen piles his trade with skills and unusual growth in his backyard that was passed down from his grandparents. Yes, while the working area is small and quite shady, Boland says it's proof that if you do your homework, there's a lot you can grow once you try. Mine is what I consider a collector's garden. So um, I'm been considered as being a plant snob, and I'm not uh, non-proud of that. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it as it is. And so I like to grow interesting plants, plants that people especially will say, you can't grow that here, and I like to prove people wrong. And at times, sure enough, things haven't grown. Okay, fair enough. But I've been surprised at the number of things which have grown here. Probably one of the most exotic ones that I have here in the garden are some of the orchids that I have. So I have several lady slipper orchids growing in here. Uh, that's a Dactylorhiza orchid, um, and that's from the uh, from Europe. Um, and again, people said it wouldn't grow here. You know, don't listen to anyone. Don't listen to anyone. They, they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> I got a couple of things here which actually came from a botanical garden in Japan. So that's probably the furthest away. Um, I actually have a plant growing here from seed from New Zealand and uh, so you know it has gotten around, I have gotten around, but I would say the vast majority of the plants are coming from say Western Europe, you know, so it's the UK, France, Germany, sort of that part of, of Western Europe or from North America. It used to be a sunny garden, now it's become a shady garden because I love Japanese maples and that's sort of, the, I guess, the main tree that I'm growing in here are Japanese maples. I love orchids. They're not easy to come by, they're expensive, and you really had to prepare the sites properly to keep them happy. But if you're willing to do the work for something that you think is really special, you know, as, as, a, as a favorite plant, I'm willing to go that extra mile to be able to do that. Um, and I have a lot of hostas as well. and so. And people will say, oh my gosh, he's a collector and he's only got hostas? How mundane is that? But, and I actually have probably 50 to 60 different varieties of hostas, but they're just such a, a versatile group of plants, easy plants, 
you know, and even for me, I like to have a few easy things that are nice and reliable. Humongous variety in amongst those. They can grow in the sun, they can grow in the shade, you can get them quite large, you can get them little miniature ones as well. Um, and it's just a really nice, versatile plant. And people think about plants, you know, they're looking for color all season long. And unless you've got a garden full of annuals, which I have none, then you're not going to get color all summer. So I rely a lot on foliage. And hostas are one of the best plants to go with when you're looking at foliage to carry through the entire growing season. Some of those plants were so <laughs> nice. I would love to walk through that garden and have a look at those. Mm -hmm. oh, great stuff. <laughs> okay, so we're going to get to uh, our local weather in just a moment. But first, uh, Ashley, some are still seeing the effects of uh, Hurricane Ida. Yeah, that's right. Parts of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania still uh, getting hit with record breaking rainfall and flooding. And some of the video we're seeing is just incredible. Uh, let's go to freelance reporter William Denslow, who is on the ground in New York. It's a beautiful day here in New York City. The sun is shining, but the impact of the deluge of rain that New York City received overnight still being felt due to post tropical cyclone Ida. As you can see behind me some remnants of that heavy rain still seen here in Brooklyn and it was on this street overnight it was essentially underwater almost unrecognizable practically impossible for cars to move there is a parking lot just behind my left shoulder and hours after it stopped raining here in New York City still incredibly high levels of water had collected in that parking garage now to put the amount of rain into perspective. Well, for the first time in the city's history, the National Weather Service declared a flash flood emergency when it came to the amount of rainfall. Well, just over a week ago, when Tropical Storm Henri hit the city, it brought with it the wettest hour recorded in the city's history at the time, just shy of two inches falling in New York Central Park. That record was then shattered on Wednesday evening with over three inches of rain being recorded in a single hour in Manhattan's Central Park. The National Weather Service estimating that anywhere between six to ten inches of rain may have fallen in parts of New York. There were of course also tornadoes seen in the states of New Jersey and Pennsylvania as well. We've heard from New York's governor Kathy Hochul. She says she sends her love and condolences to the families that lost loved ones. She says that this was a record shattering event. I have been to so many catastrophic flooding events from Lake Ontario to Long Island to now to the city. So no, this is not unusual anymore. Anyone who says it's once in a century, once in 500 years, I don't, I'm not buying it. New York City's Mayor Bill de Blasio has pointed the finger of blame squarely on climate change, saying this is the biggest wake up call we can get. That very much a point reiterated by US President Joe Biden. William Denslow for CBC News, New York. So that just goes to show you that even though it had already made landfall, we're still seeing uh, the effects of that uh, as it headed across the U.S. and uh, still seeing those effects. So parts of, uh, like I said earlier, the maritime provinces, and then eventually we will see the remnants as well. Now, as we head into Saturday, we're going to see the heaviest rain, at least at this point, that's what it's looking like, the heaviest rain falling for eastern areas of the island, likely going to see uh, potentially 10 to as much as 20 millimeters of rain with that uh, as the day goes on, then we should actually see some clearing into the afternoon. But the actual area of low pressure is still sitting over the maritime provinces. So we're still going to stay unsettled through the day on Saturday for parts of the island and more rain on the way, less heavy, but still that chance of showers. And then that will continue into Sunday as well. Eventually things will clear up across Labrador, but you'll see the next system roll in as we get into uh, Monday at this point into the afternoon. So temperatures on Saturday back up into the 20s, about 23 degrees for St. John's, 18 towards Gander, and uh, going to hang on to a little bit of humidity, and then that will end as that moisture pulls off uh, offshore. And then temperatures up across Labrador, uh, cool, 10 to 12 degrees, a little bit less than what you should be sitting this or where you should be sitting this time of year. But sunshine for both the north and the west. And then as we get into Sunday, staying clear and 
calm uh, for most of the big land. Some showers possible for coastal areas, but then uh, we're looking at that chance of showers, like I said, moving back in. Temperatures cooling down as well. So about uh, 11 to 15 degrees, a little warmer in the east, about 19 degrees for St. John's. That will be your daytime high. After that, as we get into Monday, Monday looking cool, going to keep that chance of showers in there. We'll still see the sun at times, but going to keep that chance of showers in there and then uh, back into uh, more showers. It looks like some periods of rain are certainly possible as we get into Tuesday, uh, hovering around 17 degrees. Now for central Newfoundland, uh, that drop in temperatures uh, comes on Sunday, going to continue to creep up slowly as we get into Monday and Tuesday, but uh, it does look like rain will be the story. Uh, same thing for western Newfoundland. Now Saturday night, we'll see some more showers. Sunday morning, we'll see some more showers, and then we should actually see uh, either skies clear out uh, or rather stay cloudy or a few peaks of sun through the afternoon. And then again, Tuesday will be unsettled. Now for Eastern Labrador, Sunday and Monday looking fairly nice. Again, that next system will roll through. Temperatures will be uh, into the teens for you and same thing for Western Labrador. Take a look at this shot. This is Burgio Harbor after the rain last night. Tracy captured that lovely uh, rainbow there. Thank you for sharing that photo with us. And if you have any weather photos that you would like to share with us, send them to NL Photos at cbc.ca. Oh, that is so pretty. Burgio, shot, Burgio is a beautiful spot. It really is. Look at that. Great angle. I was too. just going to say that. Loving. Great vantage point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's it for us tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Hope we see you again tomorrow. Good night. Good night.